Well, good morning once again. I, I just before I begin preaching, I do want to thank uh, Rob uh, and Luke, uh, Isaac uh, and Jason uh, behind the camera as well. My thanks very much uh, to you thus far. Well, many years ago, I was uh, an associate minister actually uh, in a church and I got to know uh, a deacon called Roger really well. Roger and I became really quite uh, close friends. Now, Roger was as po-faced when he was in public as a um, Teletubby called Poe. He was always really serious when he's doing a kind of public presentation. In fact, he once told me that he was horrified when leading a Christmas carol service, he got up and heard himself say, we shall now sing while shepherds washed their socks by night. He was absolutely mortified. He kept his humour, as it were, uh, private. In fact, he and I would often exchange a, a joke or three uh, during a, a deacon's meeting, and it was quite easy at times as the associate minister, not the senior minister, uh, leading that deacon's meeting. Well, to be honest, um, wind of that might have got out because at a church meeting that we were at, when uh, Roger was up for re-election uh, as a deacon, uh, Roger did not get re-elected. Um, sometimes uh, it happens when you put yourself forward as a, for the diaconate for the first time for re-election, uh, sometimes these things happen. So obviously a very disappointing moment for uh, Roger. And it was almost a case of thinking, well, Roger, over and out. Except that it wasn't, because it so happened that the next item on the church meeting agenda was a report from the overseer of the home groups. And that was Roger. So immediately after hearing that he had not been voted in uh, again as a deacon, Roger had to come up and present a report about the home groups uh, to the church. And I don't think I was the only one in that church meeting thinking, I wonder how Roger is going to cope with it. And you know what? Roger was absolutely fantastic, thoroughly gracious, and gave that report really well without any attitude, any sense of disappointment or rejection. And the reason why Roger was able to do this was that Roger loved Jesus. And for him, the unity of the church in the spirit, and in particular, the unity of the spirit in that church meeting, mattered more to him than him perhaps sharing something of his uh, disappointment. A very spiritually mature man, uh, Roger, uh, very serious uh, upfront, quite funny uh, in private, and now I believe he is actually with the Lord. During this pandemic, how far are you and I working for the unity of the spirit within uh, the life of Castlehall? Now, I know that there are some who are working their socks off uh, during uh, this time. There will be some at Castlehold, a considerable number actually, who will emerge from this uh, pandemic, uh, exhausted frankly, with the extra work that they have put in to maintain the unity of Castlehold, to maintain the unity of the spirit during this time of pandemic. And I do want to give my thanks to those people for the work that they've done thus far and the work that they will need to do for what, is hope, for what we hope will be uh, a short uh, while longer. And once again, for the Apostle Paul, the unity of the church uh, is primary as well. Not at any price, as we shall see, but the unity of the church moving in the unity of the Spirit. That matters supremely to Paul, who says, of course, at the beginning of uh, chapter 4 and in verse 3, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That was a challenge that Roger was able to rise to at that church meeting. Is this a challenge that we are rising to ourselves? Well, somebody once said that there are two types of people. Those who divide people into two types of people uh, and those who don't. I, I think I kind of come into the uh, former category. I do sometimes divide people, rightly or wrongly, into two types of people. And it seems to me that when it comes to our Christian faith, there are two types uh, of Christian in the sense of there are those Christians who emphasise their rights as believers and there are those Christians who emphasise their and our responsibilities 
as believers. And both groups, of course, are correct to emphasise uh, both. I guess, to be honest, I kind of veered towards the latter group, actually, uh, reminding others a lot, uh, reminding myself not quite so much, I'm afraid, about our responsibilities as Christians. The danger is when we focus exclusively on one or the other. If we're only focusing upon our responsibilities as Christians, and if we are only telling other Christians about their responsibilities as Christians, it ends up joyless, and it can actually end up almost pharisaical. We can become like the elder brother, as it were, in the story of the prodigal son. However, if we're only emphasising our rights as Christians, if we're only emphasising the fact that we are, as one book title actually put it, living like a king's kid, if we're only focusing upon the rights that we have as fellow heirs with the Jews, that by itself, with no emphasis upon the responsibilities, can frankly lead into self-indulgence uh, and an inward-looking rather than an outward-looking church. What Paul does in Ephesians is he does focus upon both. He focuses upon our rights as Christians, Gentiles as well as Jews together, but also he focuses upon our responsibilities uh, as believers in the Lord too. And we're now, of course, at the midway point in Ephesians. See, my maths isn't uh, that bad. Uh, six chapters, and we're now starting at chapter four. Yes, Rob, the accountant, is quite impressed with my maths uh, at that particular point. We are at this midway point, and this is where there is indeed, therefore, a move on Paul's part from the emphasis being upon our rights and the joy that we have and the hope that we have, that we are part of the church, uh, to our responsibilities. But notice that as there is this shift to our responsibilities as believers, the message of hope still is there. We have this hope because we have these rights as Christians. We have this hope because we have this responsibility to tell others about Jesus, and we have this responsibility, once again, to uh, project um, with honour the family name. Or as Paul says, actually, right at the beginning of chapter 4, lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. I guess what we're doing in this second half of Ephesians now is focusing more on the doing of the Christian life rather than the being. And although it's quite common to hear the phrase that we are human beings, not human doings, what we do, certainly as believers, really does matter. And to a certain degree, it actually shapes our, our being. And as we shall also see, what we don't do as believers truly uh, matters as well. And so this morning, my challenge is, first of all, do you know God as your father? Are you part of his family? Is Jesus central in your life? And if you can answer yes, yes, yes to those questions, the further challenge is, are you and I walking worthy, or worthily rather, of that calling? Are we doing that as well? Well, I'd love to say, once again, that the Apostle Paul doesn't do things by halves. Uh, he does. Uh, and certainly with this chapter, as well as the chapters which have gone before, it does seem to split the chapter into two halves. And speaking very broadly, it seems to me that in the first 16 verses, he, sp he focuses on those things that we should do. Uh, and in the, uh, from verse 17 onwards, I believe he focuses mainly, not exclusively, but mainly on those things that perhaps we shouldn't do uh, as uh, believers. Well, once again, if we're to walk worthy of this calling, what actually is this calling to which we are called uh, to walk worthy? Well, once again, uh, my deacon friend Roger got it exactly right, that we are to do everything that we possibly can to maintain the unity of the Holy Spirit so that the gospel can be preached. And you can see how much unity 
and oneness matters for the Apostle Paul from verse 4. I mean, verse 4 reads like the one show. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. You know, I think it's quite tragic, to be honest. I'm becoming more and more convinced as I get older that in a, a worldwide church made up of apparently over 90,000 denominations, what scripture actually speaks of is the one God and the oneness of this new community. Having said that, we do need to note that for the Apostle Paul, it was never unity at any price. When Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, we have uh, two letters, there were almost certainly four. He said on one occasion about one person, expel the immoral brother. When he was writing a letter to one local church, not a round robin letter here once again, to the church at Galatia, at one stage Paul said that he wished his opponents would go and castrate themselves. I mean, Paul could be really quite intolerant and he was intolerant of immoral behaviour, and he was intolerant of false teaching. So for Paul, the unity that we have as believers is not at any price. It's not at the lowest common denominator. The oneness that we have is when we have Jesus at the centre of our lives individually uh, and corporately, where we worship Jesus as our Baptist Union Declaration of Faith says actually, uh, we worship Jesus whom Scripture reveals. Be very wary of going away from the commands of Scripture to try and achieve unity. This is not the unity or the oneness about which Paul speaks in his uh, ministry as an apostle in prison at this time. But what Jesus does give us is a diversity of gifting. Now we will be aware, we are aware, sorry, of the phrase unity and diversity. And I think sometimes we think of that phrase as two things that we've got to somehow kind of hold together. They're really pulling apart, but we've got to try and hold them together. What Paul teaches from verse 7 onwards in chapter 4 is that the diversity of gifting the diversity of grace gifts, and charismata means grace gifts, by the way. This diversity of gifting that Jesus brings us enables the unity of the Spirit to happen. Enables the spread of the gospel to happen. So we must make every effort to maintain the unity of the Holy Spirit. We must have a heart and mind attitude that sees that as primary even during our times of individual disappointment, perhaps, in the life of our own uh, local church. But we must also take on board the wonderful truth that Jesus has showered his grace gifts upon us, and they are to be used for the uplifting, the upbuilding, and the maturing of the church, so that, once again, we have this dazzling new community to share with a divided and really quite dark uh, society. And interestingly enough, um, in uh, chapter 4 and uh, in verses 11 to 12, he focuses in on some specific gifts and ministries, uh, which has often, I think, inaccurately been called the fivefold ministry. Uh, he speaks of apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. I think the latter two uh, are linked. Uh, certainly they're linked in the Greek. And I think they're linked in uh, common parlance and experience as well. If we are to be pastors, or shepherds of course, as the ESV uh, uh, puts it, we must not be spending our time washing our socks by night. Um, rather, we should be involved in good, biblical, sound teaching. It is a mistake, frankly, when somebody tries to pastor a church and lacks the ability to be a biblical teacher. And so for me, it's more fourfold, to be honest, rather than uh, fivefold. But the point here is that Paul is saying that Jesus has showered his gifts and ministries upon his church so that God
God's church can be built up so that we can uh, reach uh, maturity. Incidentally, there is something of a red herring, it does trip some people up, in verse 8. Because here, Paul quotes Psalm 68 and verse 18, which if you read it uh, in your Bibles, it says at the end, he receives gifts from men, not that he gave gifts. Uh, but this is, a, he, this is a red herring. Uh, the Hebrew is quite capable of being interpreted in either way, and actually both would have happened. When a king established his kingship in a territory, he took bounty and booty off the existing people and gave those gifts to his own people. And I think there is something here. Uh, and I remember, do remember somebody speaking about this 20, 30 years ago, about at the moment, it seems that Satan has a lot of the resources. At the moment, it appears that Satan is in the uh, ascendancy. But Jesus has come and will come again. And all of that will be taken from Satan and given back as part of God's uh, new uh, creation. So then, our responsibilities as Christians, which are real, uh, include making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit, but also being very much aware that God has showered his gifts upon us and each and every one of us need to explore and to discover what our own gifting uh, and ministry is. And you may not have the gifting and ministry of apostle or prophet, pastor, teacher or evangelist, but you will have a gift you will have a ministry which is just as important as that fourfold ministry. What is your gift? What is your ministry? Is this a quite an important question for you to explore during this time of pandemic? And maybe explore all over again. I think one of the big challenges of us being very much a new and different church when we come back and not just the interior refurb but a new and different kind of church is that many of us may need to pick up new challenges. Some of us may need to develop gifts and ministries. All of us will need to rise up to a significant challenge when we reconvene as a church. All of us will need to do that for the increasingly challenging times uh, ahead. So there's a thought. Uh, during this time, even if you are, and I'm sure that you are, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit, are you also seeking to discover what your gifting and your ministry uh, is? Well, secondly, and, and much more briefly, as per last Sunday, actually, from verse 17 onwards, where Paul writes about the old life and the new life and the need to put off uh, and put on. Clearly then quite a blunt challenge about our responsibilities to do things and not to do things. You know when we do have our first Sunday back together again I can't help but wonder what our Sunday best will look like because after all many of us have been away from a church service for quite a, a, a long time. I wonder if some of us are going to turn up on our first, first Sunday back um, in a pink dressing gown with perhaps crocodile slippers uh, and that's perhaps just the men. I, I, I wonder if three quarters of the church will turn up on Tuesday evening for the Sunday morning service, uh, the time it seems when most people uh, do actually uh, watch at this uh, live stream. And there may well be a new discipline that we're all going to have to relearn. Have you got your Bible? Got the wine gums, I think it's Adrian preaching. Got the face mask, no, not the face mask that, that you slept in, the face mask for you for your mouth. There will be, when we return as a church together, a putting off of a way that we have lived and a putting on of a new way of living or a return back to a way uh, of living, which now seems a very dim uh, and distant memory. The point is that these are doing things, which once again is important, and they are 
choices. It wasn't so long ago that when we were being erroneously taught that our behaviour is predetermined and it's all down to our uh, genetics. Thankfully, the Human uh, Genome Project has put an end to all of that uh, nonsense. The reality has always been that we have choices to make. Now, some people have much more choice than others. I absolutely accept that. But we all have choices about what we will do and what we won't do, certainly in regard to our discipleship and our rights as fellow heirs with Christ. And Paul, in the remainder of chapter 4 here, largely focuses on the Gentiles, not so much the Jews, and reminds the Gentiles that what they formerly did before they became fellow heirs, they must now put to death permanently. I'm so pleased that Rob uh, read from James, where James speaks about resisting the devil. If we resist the devil in the power of the Holy Spirit, particularly if we do this together and are united uh, together, the devil will flee uh, from us. You know, choosing not to do something is just as important as choosing to do something. It really is just as important. And part of our responsibility as believers is that we choose not to do those things that perhaps we may have done before we became Christians. And as it were, to give ourselves and God a 24-hour daily contract with regard to that, that this day I choose to serve Jesus. This day I choose to proclaim his kingdom. This day I choose not to behave in the way that I formerly did. I think, by the way, that we have a real problem with Facebook and social media on this regard. We live in a culture which is too instant, uh, and perhaps we need to relearn this moment of pause and reflection so that we make correct uh, choices. I, I do love the, the wonderful true story of somebody who had noticed that his pet tortoise had uh, disappeared uh, and instantly put on Facebook how annoyed he was, how angry he was that his tortoise had been stolen. And then within uh, half an hour, went back on Facebook to say that actually his tortoise hadn't been stolen, his tortoise had just buried itself. You know, we live in a very instant society, a very easily outraged and offended society. I wonder if you're aware of the thinking now that we are becoming increasingly addicted to outrage and distress. The Apostle Paul says to us all, let's go the other way. Let's pause and reflect and choose not to do that which we formerly did and to choose now to honour the family name because God is our Father. Well as we shall see in the next uh, two Sundays um, Paul moves into more specific areas after having established this general principle he moves into more specific areas as to what our responsibilities are as Christians. Our responsibilities as husbands and wives, our responsibilities as children, our responsibilities as employers and, and employees, and supremely our responsibilities as Christian soldiers for him. We are fellow heirs to our Heavenly Father's family name. So let's walk worthy of that calling. Because if the church doesn't, pretty soon it's going to be Roger over and out. Amen.